All righty, here we go. We are recording. We are here with Elliot Overton. Uh, it's it's really nice to have Elliot come on. Uh, it, Elliot is one of these guys that can um, shed new light on things that, and, and, and you know, you, you'll forgive me for the pun there because life is going to be talking about today. But, you know, Elliot is one of, the, one of these guys who can look at things and shed new lights on things and, and explain things in a way that, I find really accessible. I, I and I don't know if you know Elliot, but the last chat you and I had, the one about oxalates, is something like fifteen thousand views now. Uh, yeah, that, I mean that's done really, really well. So you know, welcome Elliot. I'm I'm really pleased that that you could spare the time to to come on and 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 do this today. Um, you know, this I've had, I've had three and a half hours online with Drew Morg this morning already. <laughs> Um, so it's a big day online for me, and I've been building a fence at the new house uh, in between. So yeah, pretty pretty shagged, but uh, keen as mustard to hear all about light and uh, you know red light and blue light and full spectrum light and its ramifications for us um, in terms of physiology and stuff. So um, before we crack into that, how are you, mate? What's been happening? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Um just uh powering on making some new videos on the channel um yeah. and yeah just doing what okay so the do, channel's yeah. going well it yeah it's, it's getting there yeah uh past 2000 subscribers yesterday Rock so on. um yeah yeah it's uh it's good for a couple of months work you know and uh, i enjoy it it's it's cool to make content so uh if people benefit from it as well then that's the best thing so yeah, thanks for having me okay. on. But. No, not at all. And um, anyone that's not subbed to Elliot's channel, uh, that's one of my subs, get yourself over there after this and get yourself subbed to Elliot's channel. Also, have a, have a look at that chat that he and I had. Uh, <clears throat> oh, God, it was probably a couple months ago now, wasn't it? Yeah. We, talk, we talked about oxalates. Uh, that was a really, really good one. Uh, for those that, that don't know, you're in for an absolute treat with Elliot because uh, this, is, this is a guy who can present his ass off. Yeah, this is a guy who knows how to how to tell us about stuff and so you know this is less of an interview and this is more me putting him up on his high legs and saying you know enlighten us um so i'll sit here quietly pretty much and he can do his thing for the next however long it, it you know it is to, to get the message over uh, i believe it's a, a lesson in two parts today so that'll be good um so it's all yours my man you can do the screen share thing and um tell us all about it right fantastic um, let me just get that up. Um, right, is it is it sharing now? Okay, I've got me on the screen and I've got a little you. Um, we don't seem to have screen share. There we go. There it is. Beautiful. Right. We're up. Okay, fantastic. See if you can move me out of the way. Right. Okay. Just just, just grab my window um, and drag it to somewhere better. There. There we go. That'll do. Yeah. We don't mean. Yep. Beautiful. Okay. Right. Fantastic. So. Go for your life. Um. Start from the beginning. Right. There we go. Yeah. So. Um. Yeah. Thanks again for having me on, Bart. Um. Today, this presentation, we're basically going to go through several different things. Um. And really, we're going to be looking at the effect that different kinds of light are actually having on human physiology. So before some of your listeners turn off and think, okay, big deal, you know, I'm going to be healthy, I'm going to follow this diet, and I'm going to follow this nutrition, and this is going to be really good. The story is a bit more nuanced than that, because there's a very under-acknowledged or under-appreciated aspect governing health and that is essentially the effect that light is having on the human body and um, when we think of light we often take this stuff for granted so we wake up and the sun's shining and we go to bed and the sun's um set and um, we kind of don't really think much more than that um we might look at sunlight producing vitamin d and that's generally what gets the spotlight but essentially the the topic is a whole a whole lot more complex than that and it turns out that light is is really fundamentally important for governing um 
how we are processing food, how we are dealing with nutrition. And it's, yeah, as, as we're going to see throughout the presentation, it's, it's a really important thing. And, you know, my training is in nutrition. So you would think that if you go to a nutritionist, they're going to tell you about what foods to eat. But essentially, I've come to, to kind of the conclusion that actually light is just as important as food and getting the right types of light at the right times of day um, is, is going to be just absolutely essential for maintaining a healthy body. And so this presentation, as, as Bart said, um, what I've essentially done is I've split this up into, into two kind of sections. And some of you may have heard of a, the concept of photobiomodulation. This is essentially where we are using specific frequencies of light or specific colors of light um, to to fulfill certain functions. To um, We use it in therapy, typically near infrared and red light. You may have heard of the Juve. Um, different types of devices which emit certain frequencies of light and, and they can actually have amazing effects on, on how the human body is working. Um, they can be used for repair, for injury, for all kinds of different health conditions with very good results. And so, first of all, we're going to go into the how or we're going to look at, at why why we can use light, how we can use light, and, and why light is so fundamentally important for governing how the human body is functioning. And then we're going to go into some more specific details about how we can use certain frequencies of light to affect change. Okay, so first of all, um, nutrition, when we think of health, we usually think that if we follow a healthy diet, if we try to get all of the, the right macronutrients and micronutrients and we avoid the toxins, then we are going to be healthy. <clears throat> but the way that I like to think of this, the way that I like to try to teach my clients to think about this as well, is actually the human body as an information system. Okay. And so we are bombarded with lots of different forms of information. To some extent, we actually have some say in the type of information that we allow to become almost incorporated into our system. And so I like to think of nutrition as information. It contains macronutrients, so proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, if you're eating carbohydrates. <laughs> and and it also contains micronutrients. So you have the various fat-soluble vitamins, you have the B vitamins, you have the minerals, etc. And all of these things are incorporated into the body and they really affect how we are processing various things. Um, but <clears throat> at the same time, what we have to try to get our heads around almost is that nutrition is simply one input. It's simply one form of information. And in fact, there are many other kinds of information that we come into contact with. And so how we are processing food, how we're processing nutrition, we have to digest it, we have to metabolize it, and then we have to store some of it as well. And really, how we are processing this is actually governed by light. Okay, so this is something that many people don't really understand. And this is something that I would really like um, at the end of this topic for you to have a, a better understanding of how light is essentially governing what we do with food and really why it is just as important as food. Because you can be eating a very, very good diet, but if you are exposed to the wrong types of light at the wrong times of day, or you don't get the you don't get other kinds of light which you're meant to, you're designed to get, then this can really um, this can really negatively impact what you are doing with that nutrition. Okay, so <clears throat> some very basics, and I want to make the kind of um, just just for the listeners to know, I'm I don't know much about physics. You know, I'm not an expert in this in this area. But essentially, the basics are, you, the listeners probably have heard of or they know um, the term electromagnetic radiation. So electromagnetic radiation, essentially um, a way that energy travels through space. So we are surrounded by many forms of electromagnetic radiation. 
Um, the way that electromagnetic radiation is essentially classified is what is called the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so in the electromagnetic spectrum, you have differing um, wavelengths or th frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. We see with increasing energy and increasing frequency, you have things like gamma rays and X-rays. X-rays are used in medical practice. We have the light spectrum, so we have ultraviolet, we have visible light, infrared light. We also have microwaves, radio waves, etc. Okay, so much of this radiation coming coming from the sun is actually bombarding Earth. It's it's reaching Earth's surface, and and um, the atmosphere is somewhat kind of filtering the the types of radiation that we become exposed to. Um, but essentially, sunlight is is is. It, throughout evolution, sunlight has driven the processes on Earth, okay? And, and we are not separate from that. So we are just as dependent on sunlight as plants are. And, and there's various reasons for this. But when we look at the electromagnetic um, spectrum, uh, a portion of that is, is actually what is called the solar spectrum. And this is um, the various types of light. And so light is, is essentially um, broken down into, you have visible light. So when you look out at sunlight it, it, in, in, in at the midday sun, it, it looks white, but actually it, it's not white. It's, it's broken down or it can be classified as various different colors. And, and the colors are referring to the frequency or the wavelength of the electromagnetic, the electromagnetic radiation coming from the sunlight, if that makes sense. So, for instance, we have on the higher energy or the higher frequency, we have the ultraviolet light. And we can't see that. We can't pick that up with our eyes. But as you get toward the, the, the lower frequencies, what we see is we have visible light. And this is broken up into different types of colors. So we have blue and we have green and yellow and orange and red. Uh, and past that point, beyond what we can see with our eye, we also have many forms of infrared. And these are further classified into near infrared and far infrared. And you have several different classifications. Um, and we're surrounded by this stuff all the time. And even though we can't see it, um, it's affecting the human body in so many ways that people don't necessarily know about. So... The, as I've just said, the, the human body is really dependent on these forms of energy, on these um, these various wavelengths of light to coordinate the various functions. Um, and so light plays a key role in physiology. And when we think about light's effect on health, um, it's not just about vitamin D. You, you've probably heard... <clears throat> you've probably heard lots about the benefits of vitamin D. And we're not going to really talk much about that because that's been covered in depth elsewhere many times before but essentially there are um the different kinds of light that we are coming into contact with either through the eye or through the skin um these are actually having differing effects on how things are working at the cellular level so how we are producing energy how we are moving things throughout the body, for instance, in our cir circulatory system, or even at the cellular level, so transporting things in and out of cells, how we are detoxifying, how we are repairing um, damage that's occurred throughout the day, and also how we are coordinating what needs to be done at what time. So there is the circadian rhythm, and this is essentially referring to the 24-hour cycle of night and day and how the human body is essentially adapted to that, how we know what to do at what time. Because your body needs to perform things um, in the morning time that it doesn't need to do at the night time. Okay? You need to be ready for the day for the day, so to speak. You need to be able to um, act quickly. You need to be alert. Whereas at nighttime, you need to be um, essentially um, your body needs to be able to repair and regenerate and you need to rest. 
So, so essentially, when we are looking at how light is affecting the human body, and we will go into this in a lot more detail shortly, but it's important to understand that light is absorbed by the human body um, in many different ways. And, and, and there is something called the principle of photochemical activation. Okay, so this is a, a law in physics, and this is basically stating that it's only light which is absorbed by a system which can come or which can bring about some kind of photochemical or biological change. And so the way that light is affecting us is it's actually being absorbed by certain molecules in our body. And we have lots of these different molecules. And a molecule that is absorbing light is actually called a chromophore. Okay, chromophores, these are like molecular light antennas, so to speak. Chromophores, uh, we have many different types dotted in the different types of cells, and they can absorb specific frequencies of light. Okay, and so we have, for instance, and this is what many people don't know, many of the amino acids which we take from dietary proteins, such as tyrosine or tryptophan, phenylalanine, these are what we call aromatic amino acids. And what does this mean? Well, it actually means in their molecular structure, they contain something called a benzene ring. Okay, and the benzene ring is a chromophore. And a chromophore being with its ability to absorb certain frequencies of light makes these these amino acids light sensitive these amino acids are actually absorbing light in the uv range okay we tend not to think of this we tend to think of nutrition simply as kind of matter simply as food that we just take in Whereas actually there is, a, there is this whole aspect of how light is actually affecting how we are processing amino acids as well and what those amino acids are going, going to do in the body. Okay, and so here is a very good kind of slide. This is taken from um, an expert in the field of photobiology and his name is Dr. Alexander Wunsch. Okay, and so here's a very good... Um, a diagram of how these aromatic amino acids absorbing UV light are actually intimately involved in how we are adapting to sunlight. Okay, so we have phenylalanine, which is going on to produce tyrosine or converted into tyrosine. And tyrosine absorbing UV light is actually going on to make all of these different molecules, melanin, dopamine, adrenaline, noradrenaline, okay, these are all intimate, these are all um, integral for adap adaptation to the different forms of light. And I highly recommend going to Dr. Alexander Wunsch's page. He's got a Vimeo account and he's done many lectures on the topic of how human, how the human body is affected by different kinds of light. But when we're talking about chromophores, when we're looking at how the body is absorbing light, there are many different other ones as well. So we have those aromatic amino acids, which are absorbing light in the UV range. But we also have melanin. And we know of melanin, if you're fair skinned and you go out in the sun, you will actually develop a tan or you will, your skin will start to brown and that is the action of melanin we also have oxy and deoxyhemoglobin this is how we are transporting oxygen throughout the body um these are our, our biological chromophores and at the same time everyone knows of vitamin d and so you have a precursor for vitamin d which is called 70 hydro 70 hydro this is another chromophore in the UVB range. When it absorbs UVB light, we actually convert it into the active form of vitamin D. And the active form of vitamin D is the thing which is essentially going on to perform all of those amazing functions with regard to the immune system and everything like that. And there are also cellular chromophores, which don't get very much attention, but if we look at the mitochondria, and we're going to go into this in a lot more depth shortly, but the mitochondria, uh, a portion of the mitochondria or a complex, um, is referred to as cytochrome C oxidase or complex four. 
what this this basically contains um, two centers, a copper A and a copper B metal center as part of its structure. And these are chromophores as well. OK, these are um, very absorbent of a specific kind of light in the red and near infrared range. And this is actually very important for how the mitochondria is functioning. And if we think about how we are taking nutrition, we're breaking it down into its constituent molecules. And then we're passing them down as actually as electrons through the electron transport chain to make ATP. It turns out that ATP synthesis is actually dependent on certain types of light and it can be activated or it can be inhibited if we have certain types of light okay and this is one of the ways that light is in some way bypassing nutrition light is also facilitating how we are using nutrition as well again we have interfacial water so the body is made up mostly of water molecules um, we are really just one big bag of water walking around um, and it turns out that water is a very strong chromophore for certain types of infrared light as well now if you know anything about Gerald Pollock's work on the fourth phase of water or on easy water exclusion zone water it's called it turns out that water when it is well, theoretically, when it is in a living system, when it is in close contact with hydrophilic surfaces such as proteins, um, and that is the case in the human body, um, it actually becomes a reservoir for light energy. And this is in this is actually referring to many different types of light, but very heavily in the near infrared range. And so it acts as, a, as an energy reservoir or a battery, so to speak. And it's theorized that the water in our bodies is actually absorbing light energy. And you can use that to fuel biochemical processes. But we're going to go into that in a little bit later as well. We have the opsins, the photoreceptors. And so, for instance, in the eye, we have a photoreceptor called um, melanopsin. And this is basically very sensitive to certain, or it's a photopigment. It's very sensitive to certain types of light. And this is going to be triggering um, the circadian activation. It's going to be basically sending the signal that it's daytime. It's going to be coordinating all of the endocrine system and everything that comes with that. Um, and so basically the point that I want to make is that the human body is absorbing light and it's doing it through these different types of chromophore molecules. And it turns out that exogenous light is very important but also it seems that the human body is actually using different types of light for communication endogenously so it's actually generating certain types of light so there is the work of dr fritz pop and he um there's there's been lots of work on this over the past few decades looking at how the body actually um, or inside the cells, they're actually releasing certain types of photons called, referred to as ultra-weak biophotons, and these are in the UV and visible range. And now you can see the images here, and this is essentially detecting the photons, but this is somewhat different to your body emitting heat. Okay, so the photons that are emitted, your body is emitting UV light, and the the um the the emission or, or where the body is emitting it from does not correlate with where your body is is uh, emitting the most heat. It's it's a completely different thing, and it's theorized that actually what we are doing is we're releasing UV light, and that UV light on the cellular level is actually affecting how we are transcribing DNA, how we are you know, expressing certain genes, how we, we are coordinating intracellular functions. And there is another doctor or another researcher, Dr. Gunther Albecht Buhler, and he has been also been doing a lot of work on how certain organelles inside the cells are releasing types um, of infrared light in the near infrared range. And this is as a method of communication, a method of coordinating 
what part of the cell does what, how the cell responds to environmental signals. Um, and so it seems that we are we're taking in light from the environment, but what we're also doing is we're storing that light and we are actually emitting it or using it as a method of intracellular communication. So light appears to be integral for how things are actually functioning. And I spoke about before, <clears throat> spoke about before in circadian entrainment and so how the body is how, how how we are entrained to the external cycles of night and day and how really this entrainment is 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 extraordinarily important and more important now than it probably as ever, ever has been in our entire history because if you think human beings evolved outside we evolved without artificial lighting. And so every single function in the human body is um, is determined by what time of day it is. Okay, so for instance, in the morning time, you will wake up with a bright dose of light in your eye and <clears throat> the, the, the various processes, the hormones, the the entire metabolic system is going to be shifted toward daytime activity okay you are going to be mobilizing resources you're going to be moving you're going to be there's some degree of stress whereas it, when the sun sets at nighttime everything is going to be toned down you are going to upregulate detoxification regeneration you're going to be inactive and so the way that the entire system is functioning is going to differ with the time of day. And so the way that this system works and how we are adapted to the circadian, to the circadian rhythm, to the 24 hour cycle is actually we have every single cell has what are called clock genes. OK, and these clock genes, as I've just said, these govern all aspects of cell physiology and metabolism. And so these are essentially like little clocks in, in each of your cells. And they are, they are um, they're telling the time all of the time. And the way that they tell the time and the way that they can decide what to do at what time of day is actually based on certain entraining factors. So factors that we are coming into contact with externally which are essentially um, kickstarting or, or sending the signal to these genes, to these, um, these, these factors and saying, hey, it's the morning time or hey, it's the evening time. So you need to do this. So for instance, <clears throat> we have light. Light is a major um, entrainer. Light is entering through the eye. <clears throat> it's sending a signal to a part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus which is referred to as the central clock and this is located in the hypothalamus and the central clock this suprachiasmatic nucleus is essentially going to send messages all throughout the body to say right it's morning time and this is going to entrain all of those clock genes likewise we also have the peripheral clocks and these are entrained by food by eating times so this is one of the reasons why eating meals late at night generally in the research has very poor outcomes and actually why eating breakfast is really quite important for in training for telling the body that it's morning time Another factor is exercise. That's why exercise typically has better outcomes when it's done in the morning, outside, after breakfast. OK, so there's lots of different ways that our body needs to be able to tell the time. We have this free running cycle, this 24 hour cycle. But essentially, if you leave um, the body to run this circadian rhythm by itself, it actually it. The, 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 the cycle is slightly longer than 24 hours. And so we need to continually entrain it by getting light in the morning, telling our brain that it's morning time, getting eating food in the morning, telling our, uh, the rest of our body that it's, that it's morning time, etc. So 
as I just briefly kind of mentioned, we need to be able to tell the time. We need to be able to adapt to the environment. We need to be able to adapt to the kind of light that we're coming into contact with. And two of the main ways that we are really adapting to our light environment is one is through the eyes. This is the main, this is like the window to the souls, so to speak. And so we have, as I mentioned, opsins in the eyes. We have these photoreceptors. Um, the cells are called intrinsically sensitive retinal ganglion cells. They contain a photopigment called um, melanopsin. And so what is happening is first thing in the morning, we are getting a, a bit a dose of bright light and that is that is being picked up by this photopigment in the eye and it's sending a signal through a tract called the retinal hypothalamic tract it's going to the suprachiasmatic nucleus and it's basically saying right okay it's daytime we need to start activating things OK, there's another way that we also sense the environmental light conditions, and this is actually through the skin as well. And this is not really um, it's not surprising that it's both your eye and your skin, because these are the two surfaces which are coming into contact with the light. And so we have melanopsin, that photopigment. It's also contained within the white adipocytes. So that's the fat cells in the subcutaneous layer of the skin. OK, so these are the two ways that we are able to tell the time that we are able to pick up the light, sense the light in the environment. And this is actually going to turn out to be very important, OK, because as I've said before, at different times of day, you are going to need to perform different types of functions. And at the same time, <clears throat> at different times of day, um, there are relative dangers in terms of the type of light that you're exposed to and you need to be able to potentially protect yourself against that so here is uh, i've stolen another uh, slide from dr alexander wunsch there um, and this is basically looking at how throughout the daytime the type of light which if, if you recall me saying sunlight is the solar spectrum is essentially categorized into various different colors and different kinds types of um, classification. So you have the visible, but then you also have in the UV range and infrared. Um, and so essentially in the, 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 the time of day is going to govern um, what kinds of light are most prevalent in, in, in sunlight. And so, or, or what we come into contact with, let's say. So, for instance, in the morning time, uh, sunrise, you, you might recognize when you, if you're looking out at the sunrise or the sunset, it generally looks a, a lot more red than it does at noon. And that is because the, the main forms of light that you're deriving from that in the morning time are actually in the visible and the infrared spectrum. Now, as you get to sort of mid-morning, you get some more UVA. And then as you get to, you know, sort of midday, it, it's very heavy in the UVA. And also it's very heavy in the blue as well. So the blue... Um, is much more prevalent at midday and, and you can see that when you look out at the sunlight in the in the in the afternoon say at one o'clock in the afternoon you see it's very bright it's very hard to look at and it's kind of very blue whereas as it gets down towards sunset you lose that blue and actually it's becoming more more red and you're getting more infrared okay so the the point that i'm trying to make is that the different kinds of light that are being picked up by your skin and by your eyes are essentially going to um, send the signal or convey certain information about what time of day it is. OK. And so again, onto this slide, the, the eye is picking up certain types of light. It's sensing certain types of light. And it's actually fascinating because what it's doing is it's not just detecting light, but it's actually detecting specific colors of light, specific frequencies of light. So for instance, if it's picking up more blue, 
then that is going to convey certain information to the brain to adapt to that in some way. And we're going to look at how or we're going to look at why it's important to adapt to those different colors um, because the body really needs to um, to to pick that information up and do something with it. So, again, the eye is picking up the color temperature and also the light intensity of the light. And so when you if you go out camping and you wake up with the sunrise, essentially the bright light coming through the eye is actually sending a message to start adapting to stress bright light is essentially a stressor on your system okay so what we see is that when the when the eye is detecting bright light you are actually activating a systemic stress reaction in terms of your endocrine system your endocrine system being the hormones so you are activating the release of corticotropin releasing hormone and this goes on to essentially activate ACTH which is adrenocorticotrophic hormone and this is going to activate the production of cortisol and other stress hormones okay we see when there is bright light it activates the release of thyroid stimulating hormone gonad gonadotropic releasing hormone so you are going to be activating the the production of thyroid hormones you're going to be acting activating the production of stress hormones of sex hormones essentially this bright light in the morning time is essentially it's a major stressor on the system okay and these these hormones these these this entire kind of milieu of stress related hormones and sex hormones are going to play a very important role um, in preparing your body actually for what's going to come later in that day so so that bright light and those that stress stimulus is a really important adaptation for when you are coming into contact with UVA light. OK, and we're going to look at why that is. So when you when you come into contact with bright light, when there is intense blue light. So as you move further towards noon, the, the intensity of the blue light is actually going to be picked up by the eye. And the only time that you find blue light in, in, in such a degree of in intensity in nature is actually going to be in the presence of UVA light as well. Remember, I said that sunlight is containing lots of different kinds of uh, classifications of frequencies. And so in the visible range, when we have color temperature in the sunlight actually increasing in the blue this is sending a signal and saying hey right okay there's lots of blue light so that means that automatically there's going to be lots of uva light as well and it's very interesting because when we look at how uva light is affecting the body we can start to understand why blue light is such a stressor because uva light let me explain. So UVA light um, is, is different to UVB light. We don't produce vitamin D via coming into contact with UVA. We produce vitamin D via coming in, into contact with UVB instead. But UVA is playing a very important role actually in the production of something called nitric oxide in the skin. So when UVA penetrates the skin, it activates the release of nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is a vasodilator. OK, so what this means is it's dilating the blood vessels and it causes something called dermal pooling. So it means that all of the, the blood, because it's dilating those blood vessels in the skin, it's causing all of the blood to go from the in, internal, internal organs toward the um, exterior of the skin. Now, whilst this is useful this is actually a potential major threat okay because if you lose too much blood in terms of as the blood is coming away from the internal organs and going towards the skin if there is excessive dermal pooling 
This can potentially lead to shock and it can be fatal. Okay, because really you need blood in your internal organs, you need blood circulating, you don't want it to pull in the skin. And that is a very potential threat with excessive levels of nitric oxide from UVA. And so what we see is that blue light, this blue light stimulus through the eye is actually releasing the stress hormones, as we saw on the previous slide because the stress hormones are counteracting this dermal pooling effect. Okay, they're actually mitigating the, 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 the vasodilation to some extent, and they are going to prevent that fatal shock. And at the same time, UVA light is also capable of degrading steroid hormones. It's capable of degrading um, many different hormones that we're using. And so when you are coming into contact with UV light, you're essentially running the risk of, of developing a hormone deficiency. And so blue light in conjunction with that is going to activate the synthesis of new stress hormones in able to counteract the fact that the UVA is going to degrade them later on in the day. Does that make sense? So mm. essentially, essentially, what I'm trying to say here is that blue light is, is a stressor. Blue light is causing us to release stress hormones, but that is because what blue light induced stress hormone activation is doing is actually mitigating the effects of UVA light. And so we see how UVA and blue light are fundamentally, they're intrinsically linked in nature. When you go out into the sunlight, when there is a high intensity of blue, this automatically, um, this, this, in nature, you would only ever find blue light with UVA light. And so UVA light is going to have all of these effects, such as nitric oxide release and potential shock. Likewise, UVA light is going to potentially degrade those hormones. So the blue light, the fact that you've adapted to the blue light, is actually going to mitigate those effects. And so blue and UVA are fundamentally coupled in many different ways. And there are also problems with this as well, because UVA light, we see that it is releasing or it's activating the synthesis of nitric oxide. But unfortunately, nitric oxide has, has got a very good reputation in terms of um, increasing circulatory capacity. However, nitric oxide in excess quantities actually has a negative effect because nitric oxide is binding to um, cytochrome C oxidase on the mitochondria. Now, when nitric oxide is bound to cytochrome C oxidase, it actually prevents electron transport chain. It prevents us from being able to make energy effectively. And this is one of the downsides of having excess UVA light. Again, blue light is also a major stressor. We see that blue light induced stress hormone activation is good in the context of UVA light because it mitigates some of those effects. But blue light is also fundamentally toxic on the cellular level. Blue light, the high energy photons coming from blue light can activate excessive reactive oxygen species. They can really damage cell membranes and all of these kinds of things. So there are problems if you just have blue and UVA light. But fortunately, in sunlight, we don't just have these two colors. In fact, we have red and infrared light. And in fact, when we start to look at red and infrared light, we see how it, it, it is, it's integral. Um, it's a fundamental, it's a fundamentally important aspect of sunlight because what red and infrared light is doing is it's counteracting the negative effects of the UV. It's counteracting the negative effects of the blue. So, for instance, one example is that UVA-induced nitric oxide synthesis, nitric oxide is binding to cytochrome C oxidase. Well, it turns out that red and infrared light can actually be absorbed by cytochrome C oxidase. And what this does is it is it dissociates nitric oxide from that complex. So you've got that block on the mitochondria. And when you have red and infrared light, it's essentially taking that block off. Likewise, 
we have the excessive um, reactive oxygen species produced by blue light, this toxic blue light. But what we also see is that when blue is coupled with red and infrared light, what red and infrared light are essentially doing is they are upregulating the endogenous antioxidant systems. They're, uh, they're um, upregulating the detoxification systems in the cell. They are reducing inflammation and they're actually protecting the mitochondria. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that when you isolate certain types of light, they can have negative kinds of effects. The UV, we see that it's beneficial in, in producing nitric oxide, but it has some downsides. The blue light, it's beneficial in activating stress hormones, which prepare us for the day and also counteract those negative effects of the UVA light. But at the same time, it's causing loads of damage to the cells. And so when we have this full complement of light, we have all of the different frequencies. We have the UV, we have the blue, but we also have the red and the infrared light. Then essentially the red and the infrared light are coming to the rescue and kind of complementing all of those different functions. And so it's really important to understand that the human body is adapted to full spectrum sunlight for this very reason. Each form of light is complementing one another. And the real problem in today's world is that artificial lights, um, fluorescence and LEDs, what these engineers, these light engineers came along to do is they engineered light sources to take away the so-called undesirable frequencies, the, the frequencies which are supposedly wasting energy. And these are the red. OK, so what they did was they've basically removed all of the different colors and the artificial lights that we now have are mostly spiking in the blue. So what we're doing is we've produced this completely unnatural light source. And if we go back to the endocrinology of what blue light is doing um, to the hormone system, if you remember, blue light is is basically sending information to the body that there is UVA present. And we know those negative those negative effects of UV, UVA, um, blue light is sending a signal to say you need to release stress hormones. You need to release sex hormones. You need to do all of these kinds of things to prepare for the stress that's coming later on in the day. The problem is, is that with these artificial lights, you're getting extreme blue exposure. So it's activating those adaptive cellular and endocrine processes, such as elevated stress hormones, without the complementary light frequencies to degrade or metabolize those stress hormones. Okay, so as we see, when you go out into natural sunlight, the blue light is increasing the stress hormone production. But at the same time, the UV light is degrading those stress hormones. Whereas when you are under artificial lighting, say you're sat in an office, you're getting the signal to produce all of these stress hormones, but you're not getting the signal to degrade them. That is a real problem in our modern world. And actually, this is why blue light is such a major stressor, because what it results in is an abnormal endocrine system and abnormal cell metabolism on every single level. It is a fundamental stressor. And this is why monitoring the exposure to light is going to be very important. And actually, if you are exposed to blue light all of the time, then your system is going to be um, tending towards stress metabolism. You are tending to, to, to be stressed at the endocrine level, um, despite what kind of diet you are eating. This, this is really bypassing nutrition in every way possible. Okay. And these effects, as I've just said, these effects are independent of dietary composition. And so there is a doctor, Dr. Jack Cruz, and I know that you've had him on, on this show before, Bart, but his information on, on, the, on these concepts, he's been talking about this for a very long time. And he kind of makes the point that essentially food is just as important as nutrition because food is governing how we are dealing with nutrition uh, sorry light 
I think I just said that wrong. Right, light yeah. is light is as important as nutrition, and light is going to govern how we are metabolizing nutrition, how we are utilizing it, and um, yeah, and so in a world full of isolated blue light. Um, you see, humans in modern environments, we are deficient in sp- full spectrum sunlight. We've been told that sunlight is dangerous. We've been told to cover up and to actually put toxic chemicals on our skin um, to prevent us from being able to to absorb this light. Okay, and this stuff is toxic: titanium dioxide, uh, factor fifty sunscreen. The, the human body is not designed to to process that stuff we are optimally adapted to be in the full spectrum sunlight sunlight provides the body with a full complement of tools to harness solar energy and red and infrared light is necessary to protect us against the damaging effects of other light frequencies and now what does this fundamentally mean well red and infrared light are like nature's healing tools Okay, they they mitigate all of those other negative effects. And it actually turns out that we can utilize red and infrared light therapeutically. We can tap into the healing benefits that nature provider provided us in sunlight. And actually, I think that this is going to be more important than ever um in our modern world because we are surrounded by blue light and we are actually blue light toxic. And so here we, we're going to see how we can tap into the healing red. Okay, so you may have heard of something called low-level light therapy, low-level laser therapy, or photobiomodulation. And there have been lots of different interviews on this, lots of presentations, and there's lots of papers. And I'm going to um, provide the listener with some with some recommended reading and listening after this. Because really, it's a fascinating topic. And when I first came across it, I didn't really understand it. It didn't really make sense. Um, It seemed a bit crazy, actually, using red light, using certain types of light. And I kind of thought that it probably didn't work because it didn't make sense to me. Um, And it's, it's important to know that this is not using heat lamps. This is not heat lamps. So when we think of an infrared light, we're talking about heat lamps. This is completely different. This is, in fact, this is not having heating effects on tissues, okay? It's actually in the red and near-infrared spectrum. So these lights, they many of them don't emit very much heat whatsoever. Um, and actually, what it's working on a cellular mechanism. And again, I didn't understand why this would work. But after looking into it, the stuff that we've been speaking about thus far is looking at it in an environmental context. When we understand that light can be used by the body in many different ways, different types of light can be used by the body in many different ways. And actually, the red and the infrared are one of the ways that the sun is essentially giving us tools to mitigate those other damaging things. It makes sense now why we how we can tap into this why it is so important and so the red light is is generally referring to frequencies or wavelengths between 620 and 700 nanometers okay whereas the near infrared the this the range there is slightly larger um, and that's between 700 and 1400 nanometers but it's important to note that in the clinical research there are only um, certain frequencies which have been found to have biological effects. So, for instance, there are frequencies between 700 and 800 nanometers which do not seem to have um, therapeutic effects in terms of activating cellular processes, whereas other certain frequencies such as 630 nanometers, 680 nanometers, These are generally, they tend to be very beneficial. But what this light can be used for, essentially when we're talking about photobiomodulation, is using an artificial light device and shining it on the skin. And that light is being absorbed into the cells and it's activating certain processes, okay? 
So there is something called the dose response curve. And what this means is when we are using this light, um, we don't want to be using it for too long. Um, when we are using it for too long, there, there is actually um, an inhibitory effect. So this thing called the dose response curve or the hormetic effect, which means that you can use it um, when you basically you use a small amount, you get an increased biological effect. You use the correct amount and you get the maximum biological effect. But once you go past that point, the biological effect actually decreases and you end up with an inhibitory effect. So it's important that when you look at a device, when you're looking at how to use this device, that you don't go overboard because more is not better. OK, that's an important factor to consider if you are going to use one of these kinds of devices. Now, the parameters to consider when looking at the dose, there is the power density, which is otherwise known as the irradiance, and that's measured in milliwatts, milliwatts per centimeter squared. And then there's also the energy density. So there's lots of different devices on the market. But what I would say is that when you are going to choose a device, look for um, the power density and try to cross reference that with what has been used in the research. Now, there are a few brands which I mean, I have no affiliation with, but um, Juve is probably the best. That is, I mean, there's many scientific references there and they've got a fantastic product. They've got several products, actually. In the UK, there's also um, Red Light Man. And these guys are producing really good products that generally get very good results. And they're re relatively affordable as well. But when we are looking at what what actually happens when we use red light, when we use infrared light, we take a device, we shine it on the skin. What is occurring in the cell? Well, it turns out that uh, a majority of the effect that light is actually having at the cellular level has to do with the mitochondria. And if you're interested in nutrition, if you're interested in health, then you must have heard of the mitochondria. The mitochondria or mitochondrial function is essentially at the root of all chronic diseases, or shall I say mitochondrial dysfunction. It, it, there are many researchers who are saying that actually disease or aging is fundamentally just mitochondrial dysfunction at its root level. And so mitochondria are how we are taking electrons coming from food and actually generating ATP, which is the cellular form of energy. And this is going to allow us to respond to any environmental stresses and to basically do what we need to do. And when we can't take energy, when we can't make energy very efficiently anymore, that's when the cells start to decline rapidly. And the mechanism by which photobiomodulation is working is actually, it's being absorbed by this complex four, this cytochrome C oxidase. I said before, cytochrome C oxidase contains these copper centers, these metal centers. And what this, this, this light is doing is it's essentially dissociating nitric oxide from the, um, from the complex and actually increases the activity of that complex. It's increasing the activity of all of the complex of the mitochondria, actually. So complex one, two, three, and four, okay? It's increasing mitochondrial membrane potential. It increases ATP synthesis. It increases oxygen consumption in the cell okay so generally what it, i mean the mitochondria absolutely adores red light it really does it's 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 fascinating how this is working it's important just to note here that nitric oxide is not only released by having excess uv light on the skin but in fact nitric oxide is also involved in many different disease processes and inflammatory processes so when we are under oxidative stress when we are depleted in certain nutrients when we come into contact with things like artificial emf what is happening is is a cascade of events are essentially a trigger triggering the production of excess nitric oxide as a stress response inside the cell and the nitric oxide is naturally going to be binded to the mitochondria and stopping it from working. And so this is one of the ways that the photobiomodulation is reducing cellular stress. Okay. 
what this back, what photobiomodulation is also doing is it's actually increasing it's, it's producing a small um burst in reactive oxygen species reactive oxygen species are produced naturally as part of normal mitochondrial metabolism in small amounts and there was once um you know theories about why taking antioxidants are is going to be very beneficial but actually the research tended to show that taking antioxidants wasn't the the amazing thing that it was purported to be in the past because it turns out that reactive oxygen species and free radicals are actually really important in terms of signaling. Um, they're, they're picked up by the cell, and it, what they actually do is they send messages to the nucleus, and the nucleus actually responds and produces its own antioxidants, its own endogenous intracellular antioxidants, um, in response to that, okay, and by taking exogenous antioxidants like NAC or vitamin C, what this is potentially doing is it is reducing that natural reactive oxygen species and that natural signal for the cell to make its own antioxidants. But there is a crosstalk between the mitochondria and the nucleus. And when you have an increase in reactive oxygen species, when you have... Um, red light, which is being absorbed by the mitochondria, we have elevated levels of free nitric oxide because nitric oxide is being uh, basically unbound or, or disassociated from the mitochondria. And there's a cascade of events which, which occur, but what this is doing is it's changing the entire cellular biochemistry. It's changing how various genes are transcribed and how genes are expressed. And what you're getting is you are getting an upregulation of antioxidant related genes. You're getting an upregulation of cell defense mechanisms via this this small this small burst of ROS that, that, that this light is is producing. And so you have what are called redox sensors, um, such as nuclear factor kappa B, and this is detecting the bur burst in ROS, and it's basically gonna gonna affect how your genes are expressed. You are gonna um, express certain genes which are going to allow cells to survive and adapt to stress. Okay, so there are lots of different genes which have shown to be involved in photobiomodulation. There is one called hypoxia inducible factor. Um, there is another one, magnesium superoxide dismutase, which is really one of the cell's main antioxidants. Um, and this has been shown to increase drastically after red light exposure. There are lots of different cellular mechanisms. It's not really the purpose of this talk today to go through all of them because there are too many. But what I will do is I will point the listener in um, toward resources where they can access that for themselves. Um, what we generally see is that there is an increase in intracellular antioxidants, an increase in cell repair, an increase in regeneration of tissues. Um, and generally, when red light or infrared light is taken in the correct dose, then it could have really amazing effects, which, um, which kind of seem independent from nutrition. Okay, um, and so there is also another proposed mechanism for how infrared light or red light is working. Is that actually, as I was saying before, is that water inside the cells, water outside of the cells, inside the human body, when it is in contact with hydrophilic surfaces, when it's in contact with hydrophobic surfaces, what it's essentially doing is acting as a chromophore. It's acting as a photo acceptor for certain frequencies of infrared light. And when this happens, you get, a, um, I would highly recommend Gerald Pollock's work, look at the work, work, the work um, related to exclusion zone water, but essentially what the, the theorized mechanism is that this water system is essentially acting as a battery for um, for energy coming from this kind of light. And what you're doing is acting as a reservoir for electrons and electrons can potentially be diverted 
to the mitochondria to make energy because essentially the way that we are making ATP is funneling electrons through those complexes, okay? And so it's theoretically possible that actually deriving energy from light in the form to, to actually build a reservoir of electrons, it's possible that those electrons could theoretically go to the mitochondria and produce energy in a nutrition independent manner. Okay. And at the same time, there is also proton flow. So for instance, circulation, blood flow, if there's any edema, the structuring of water via light is actually going to be essential for how the blood is throw it flowing through the vascular system. Okay. And so many other factors involved in cellular physiology, including things like protein folding, the movement of ions across membranes, um, the movement of substances using ion pumps or, or protein pumps and things. This stuff is all going to be intimately related to the aqueous environment or the, the surrounding environment inside the cell, which if it is structured water as this reservoir for light energy, light is going to play a fundamentally important role in how cells are functioning. Okay, and so one of the key um, aspects or one of the key areas that this kind of light has been utilized in is actually in anti-inflammatory medicine. So what we see is that not only is it affecting the intracellular antioxidants, but what it's also doing is it is inhibiting um, pro-inflammatory mediators, pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, other inflammatory mediators, prostaglandins. It inhibits the COX enzymes, so the cyclooxygenase enzymes, both number one and two, it inhibits things like phospholipase A2, which is in the context of chronic inflammation, chronic pain. Um, these are key factors involved. And actually using this kind of light is able to drastically reduce pain in, in all areas. Okay. And as I said, there are many other functions, but what we see is increased blood flow and circulation, increased stem cell growth, mitochondrial biogenesis, so how well we are making new mitochondria, and also synthesizing DNA and RNA. Um, it can be shined, shined in the nervous system, increasing nerve growth factor and brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which are important for neurological functioning, learning, working capacity, etc. cetera. Uh, it, it has been experimented or investigated for its benefit in Alzheimer's. And there are many different trials actually showing that it is, it is decreasing beta amyloid plaque. Okay. Um, it can be shined on the testicles to increase the production of, of, of testosterone. In other words, steroidogenesis. So how we are producing cell uh, steroids via the cytochrome P450 system. And um, again, there are many, many, many more mechanisms, and we don't really have time to go through it. But here is just a very basic um, list of some of the things that have been, that has been investigated for. So there is a, um, there's a, um, a website uh, by, he's a, a trainee dentist. I think his name is Vladimir Heskinen or Heskinen. And um, and the website is called Valtus, so V A L T U S or T S U S. And um, basically, what this guy did was he has created a database, and there is over four thousand five hundred listed um, research papers on the use of photobiomodulation therapy using red and infrared light, um, and. I will say, I mean, I've had a look at the database. I've referred to it many different times. I don't know if there's one health condition that hasn't been investigated and hasn't shown benefit. It really is that extensive. So here is just a list. I mean, you have the basics like depression, anxiety, pain relief. But I mean, I was amazed to see some of the papers on thyroid conditions. I mean, there was one paper showing on Hashimoto's thyroiditis, shining red light. They actually managed to get 50% of all the participants off meds. 
So they stop taking their thyroxine medication. They actually regain normal thyroid function simply by shining light on the thyroid gland. There's also reversals of alopecia. Um, you know, it can actually stimulate the growth of new hair. Um, we have any kind of skin condition, anything like that, anything related to autoimmune conditions as it's modulating immune cell function it's modulating immune cell homeostasis um, it's also great in terms of infection so um, yeast infection it can eradicate candidiasis oral candidiasis but also for things like um, even gut dysfunction so actually there's some animal research showing that by shining the light directly on the stomach what they actually found was that there was a reduction in ulcer so it actually healed the ulcers but at the same time it actually increased the mucosal layer in the stomach and so it can be used for things like gas uh, gastroesophageal reflux which seems kind of kind of crazy because you wouldn't think that light could actually have that effect but it turns out that it can be used for practically any kind of addition, uh, condition, especially things like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. There is some good research on there because if you think of chronic fatigue syndrome as a mitochondrial dysfunction, and if one of the main mechanisms by which this light is operating or acting on our cells is actually by increasing the mitochondria or increasing the, the way that we are making ATP, then it would make sense. But if we go back to the bioenergetic model of health in that mitochondrial dysfunction or a decline in mitochondrial dysfunction is potentially involved in all disease, then it would make sense as to why photobiomodulation or the use of red and infrared light has such wide spanning effects and can be used for practically any condition which involves the mitochondria. It makes lots of sense when we change our perspective rather than looking at disease as kind of individual entities, rather looking at, as a, looking at it from a framework of declining energy availability, declining mitochondrial function. Okay. And so there is, many different papers on this there is um, one in particular if you're interested in the anti-inflammatory effects of photobiomodulation I definitely recommend this paper it is by one of the world leading experts his name is Michael Hamblin um, he's done lots of interviews on um, Mercola and, and many other kind of alternative health channels he's got lots of information there I recommend um, looking at his papers if you're interested in the mechanisms again the mechanisms um, going into detail is way beyond the scope of this um, presentation but essentially what, what I would have liked it to be was actually just an introduction to the concept why and how it works and um, and if you are interested you can go and look further for yourself because there's lots of resources on this um, and so, again, here are some more papers by Michael R. Hamblin. Um, very good papers, very in-depth. And then there is also Alexander Wunsch. So if you are interested um, in understanding the framework or understanding the concepts behind how human body or how the human system is optimally adapted to sunlight and how by coming into contact with other forms of light at nighttime, for instance, when we come into contact with blue light at nighttime, this has been covered on many other places, but essentially remember that blue light is signaling a stress. So blue light is going to activate the release of those stress hormones, systemic stress reaction, whilst also inhibiting the production of our sleep hormones, of our regenerative hormones, such as melatonin, this is a very important part of maintaining health and that if we are exposed to blue light at nighttime or at the wrong time of day, then this is potentially going to throw off the entire metabolic system. But that is probably a concept for another talk on another time. Um, but essentially, I highly recommend the work of Dr. Alexander Wunsch. He's got many very good in-depth um, videos and presentations on his Vimeo channel um, and he goes into a lot more depth um, he's absolutely um, 
yeah, fantastic presenter in in this field. And again, I can't go without mentioning Dr. Jack Cruz because, in fact, Dr. Jack Cruz is really quite unique in in how he has. I mean, I was interested in nutrition for a very long time. But until I came across Dr. Jack Cruz, I could never understand the significance of light, of maintaining light environments, of, 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 of optimizing your light environment. Now, he's really someone who has connected the dots in so many ways. And he is talking about, he's spoken about all of these things that I've spoken about in this presentation and 10 times more um, in, in, in 10 times more depth. And so if you are interested in learning about how nutrition is only one input and how the light environment or the light that we come into contact with actually is governing how we are metabolizing food, how we use those uh, those electrons coming from food and why it's, it's, it's something that you don't want to ignore. I highly recommend Dr. Jack Cruz. And there's also a very good interview. Um, Bart did an interview with Dr. Jack Cruz. So make, to, make sure to check that out because this guy is, is truly a pioneer. Um, and yeah, I think that's about everything. So thank you for listening. Um, I hope that that made sense. Um, ideally, what I'd like you to take away from that is, is, is essentially, if you're listening to Bart K's channel, then you probably have an interest in health. You probably have an interest in nutrition. And I'd just like to, to really try to emphasize the point that nutrition really is important we know that nutrition is important for health but really how we are how we are dealing with that how we are making the most of the nutrition how we are really processing that and utilizing it is going is going to be affected by other things and we must not ignore how our modern environments how being stuck inside 24 7 how being exposed to artificial light at night time and how actually covering our skin up from the sun from the main energy energy giver um, of all life on earth is is really problematic and why we should actually cherish sunlight and why we should get as much as much of it as we can and really try to make use of this wonderful gift that we've been given because whilst we've been talking about photobiomodulation and near infrared light therapy i would say nothing comes close to the potential of going out in the sunlight sunlight contains all of the beneficial uh, factors and really it's the way that we are designed to to act and now if you don't have access to sunlight then photobiomodulation is the next best thing. But again, photobiomodulation is also important if you have a clinical condition that needs a very targeted therapy because this can actually achieve things which nutrition doesn't seem to be able to achieve per se, and it can achieve things which sunlight in and of itself can't achieve. And so as a general recommendation, start going out, getting more sunlight, stop um, exposing yourself to artificial light in the evening time, which is going to throw off your entire cycle and, um, and learn as much as you can about light because light is a fascinating topic and we are fundamentally light beings. Um, and, and, and this is something that isn't talked about enough. So go ahead and, and listen to those researchers, read as much as you can. Cause it's, yeah, it's, it's, I really think it's one of the most important uh, factors governing health and not many people talk about it so um so yeah that that was that really um okay. yeah okay so is that there we go okay well Jerry. you know there we go oh we went a bit over there that's I fine apologize not at all. That's that's absolutely spot on. Look, Elliot, thank you so much for sharing that information with us. Um, I certainly found it to be enlightening. <laughs> I know. Sorry, it's the worst. <laughs> it's the worst. But there you go. Look, for me, people, if you if you got nothing else from the talk, what is really clear is that any time we as human beings step away from what nature intended, what how we were designed, how we evolved, 
that is going to cause us a health problem because our bodies are not geared for it. If you've got nothing else, understand that the artificial light, the incandescent lights that we have in our light sockets, the blue light coming from our computer screens. Uh, I mean, for example, I have my computer screen programmed that when the sun goes down, it blocks out the blue. So it goes mm -hmm. like a, a yellow, amber sort of a color. My phone's the same. Um, you might see the red light in my reflecting in my spectacle lenses there. That is mm -hmm. balancing out some of the, you know, um, uh, the, the unnatural because it's nighttime here in New Zealand now. It's, it's eight o'clock in the evening in, in, in mm -hmm. late autumn. Um, yeah, and, and so, you know, I, I endorse the comments around Jack Cruz being a great man to listen to. Um, I've uh, I've enjoyed talking to Jack in the past, uh, as Elliot alluded to. He, he's, uh, I, I would class him as one of my friends. Um, yeah, I, I think that Jack could simplify the way he communicates sometimes in terms of some of the, the language that he uses and stuff, but he, mm -hmm. he refuses to do that. He enjoys the way he does it, and, and it's, you know, it's his thing, and so all power to him. I mean, I would say to you that anyone that really wants to understand that stuff, you know, talk to someone like Elliot, talk to someone like myself uh, about some of that stuff. Um, basically, though, what I mean, what we're saying is that, you know, uh, electromagnetic radiation is as important to get right in our environment as putting the right things in our body. We step away from nature, we feed ourselves the wrong thing, we will suffer. Yeah. We, we feed ourselves the wrong light. We bathe ourselves in the wrong light at the wrong time of the day. We're asking for trouble there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think really, you know, if you've got nothing else from Elliot's talk, take that one away. Um, there is a natural order. There is a natural daily order of the, of the color and intensity of light. Uh, try and stay as close to that as, as possible. It's not obviously possible in modern society to stay completely with it. There are some things you can do to to mitigate any any real issues. This was just an introductory chat to to, to make everybody aware of of what the nature of the problem is. I thank you so much, Elliot. I think you did a great job at outlining exactly what the issues are. Uh, by way of summing up, I mean that's probably more than was needed already. Uh, I think you know you've you've covered it brilliantly. Um, yeah, I've I've enjoyed having you on uh, as usual. And I'm sure, you know, that all my subscribers will jump off this video and rush straight over to your channel and subscribe um, to your channel. I think we need to support Elliot's channel and, and you know, he's, he's got 2,000 subs now and that's that's well and truly deserved. I think we need to bust through 10,000 and, and get that done quickly, um, you know, because... <laughs> You know, the, the kind of information that Elliot is, is, is giving here, you know, free of charge out of the goodness of his heart to help people, it's top-notch information, boys and girls. And, you know, you need, you need to not only get onto it yourselves, but tell everyone you know, stick it on your social media sites, link to this chat, link to Elliot's site, um, basically, you know, shill the absolute hell out of it because it's, it's great stuff. And... Um, yeah, that's uh, that's what we need to do to 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 help and support each other in terms of what we are all trying to pull together to achieve here, and that is a um, a group of people who are genuinely trying to help people with their health, uh, and and I genuinely believe that that's that's where Elliot's coming from. I think that's really clear from what he says, the way he says it. Um, yeah, so that's all from me. I, I mean, I think. It's been, you know, once again, it's been a, a brilliant presentation. Um, and, uh, yeah, I hope to do something else again very soon. Uh, perhaps we'll do a collaborative uh, presentation at some point, Elliot. I don't know if you're open to that, but that'll be Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, I'd like that. Um, stick around on my channel this week. I'm going to be posting uh, a video where I'm going to do a deep dive down the rabbit hole of ketogenesis, the obsession with ketones. Um, and I'm going to be pulling in light for that one, boys and girls. I'm going to be talking about the Inuit paradox, and that's the one that, if you don't know about it, um, basically the Inuit or, or what some people call Eskimos that, that live uh, up above the Arctic Circle and uh, or, you know, have, have naturally 
lived up there for a long time and, and who have uh, consumed, you know, an almost entirely carnivorous diet. Uh, actually, uh, there is a there is a very very large proportion of them who have a, uh, a selective mutation in their in their gene pool, uh, which, when it's expressed, uh, causes a knockdown in the enzyme activity involved in ketogenesis. Uh, in other words, they are resistant to going into um, ketosis, and so obviously the vegans are using that as an argument to say that, oh, that's a, that's proof that ketogenesis is bad, uh, which is only true if you don't consider other factors like, for example, light and stuff. So anyway, um, among other things, I'll be talking about that later in the week. Uh, if you missed my chat earlier today for three and a half hours that I had with Drew Morg and we had a special guest appearance, uh, we didn't expect it, but he came on and, and he, he joined the chat and, and it was it was a good thing. Uh, we had Klaus from Plant Based News on that as well and uh, so we, we had a chance to bash a, three, a few things backwards and forwards there. And uh, out of that, it, it looks likely that he will have a word to Dr. Michael Greger for me about coming and having a chat to me about a number of things, which I've been um, saying, you know, for a long time, I'd be very keen to talk to Dr. Michael Greger about one or two things he's been saying. So, you know, uh, that's, that's all good stuff. That's what happened this morning. Uh, you've just seen what happened this evening. Stick around later in the week for the ketones chat i thank you once again elliot um yeah get yourselves over there sub to his channel um don't forget to link this one on your on your on your social media sites and and let's let's get it uh, let's get it building mm. any final words from elliot before we no i think you summed it up perfectly bart uh when you move away from nature that's when problems start to happen so yeah. you know just Going back to basics, going back to nature, that seems to be Brilliant. the way forward, yeah? So thanks Brilliant. yeah, thanks for having me, Bart. It's been great right, again. Pleasure, and we'll, thanks, uh, we'll see you again very, very soon, my man.